We're talking right now with Kip Eideberg. He is a Senior Vice President of Government and Industry Relations for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. Kip, thanks for taking the time to visit with us today. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, Dustin. So we're pretty excited. You were just in Iowa and we're hanging out with Senator Joni Ernst uh, talking about some uh, some topics going on for the for equipment manufacturers. Tell us a little bit about where you were and, and what you were doing. You bet. So we were in beautiful Knoxville, Iowa, uh, visiting with uh, Weiler. Uh, they make road construction equipment, family-owned company. Uh, Pat Weiler was uh, gracious enough to open up his facility uh, to AEM and Senator Ernst. Uh, so we were part of her 99-county tour this year. Uh, and it was an opportunity for us to talk not just about the state of the equipment manufacturing industry in, in Iowa. And, and by the way, we support 132,000 jobs in, in Iowa. But also to talk about some of our policy priorities this year, Dustin. And, and number one right now is the Bipartisan Innovation Act. That is that big global competition. Some call it a China competition bill that Congress is currently uh, talking about getting passed, hopefully here in the next few months. So tell us a little bit about what your take is on this bill and, and what benefits that you're going to see here for, for Iowa, for farmers, ranchers, manufacturers, the whole nine yards. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. This, this bill is critical to our industry, and, and let me tell you why. Uh, it includes a number of provisions that will help uh, tilt the playing field, make it level uh, for uh, U.S. equipment manufacturers, Iowa equipment manufacturers in particular, and also address some of our, our current weaknesses. So number one, uh, it, it should, if, if uh, everything goes well in Washington here the next couple of weeks, it should include the CHIPS Act. Uh, which is a measure that would provide $52 billion uh, in uh, funding for domestic semiconductor uh, manufacturing. I mean, we've all heard about the shortages of chips uh, over the past two years and what that does to, to manufacturers uh, writ large, but to our industry in particular, right? So I can tell you right now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in, in Illinois and in Wisconsin, so not too far from Iowa, uh, and right there, about eight out of 10 some cases, nine out of 10 pieces of equipment rolling off the line were missing at least one component. Uh, and in most cases, those were chips. So what this would do is it would help hopefully boost domestic manufacturing of chips, which would help us meet demand uh, and deliver equipment to customers. So that's, that's critical. And then briefly, a few other things. We hope that it will include the JOBS Act, um, which is a measure that would extend Pell Grant eligibility to two-year programs. So that if you're a young woman or man and you're looking to explore maybe a career in manufacturing, you don't necessarily need or want to go to a four-year liberal arts college, you can go to a two-year program and you can still benefit from a Pell Grant to help fund your studies. Uh, and then finally, we hope it includes some tariff relief. Tariffs continue to wreak havoc on our industry. So those are the three things that we highlighted uh, during Senator Ernst's visit to Weiler. You know, it's interesting you brought up the, the Pell Grants for two-year schools. I mean, there's been such a push on social media, whether it's been LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, uh, talking about the fact that there should be emphasis put on two-year uh, you know, education as well, as well as trade schools, whatever they are, because there are so many jobs out there that are necessary and un underfilled right now that can make some serious money for people if they're just willing to get the training and, and are pointed in that direction rather than just the traditional four-year school. Yeah, that's, uh, you could not be, be more right about that, Dustin. And, and we are seeing right now, uh, you know, record, in, in many cases, record demand for our products, particularly on the agriculture side, but even on the construction side now, coming out of COVID and with the, the funding from the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill starting to trickle out, uh, you know, strong demand for construction equipment as well. And, and we're struggling to meet that demand. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the, the input challenges. Hopefully, the, the Bipartisan Innovation Act will, will, will address that but also workforce. And, and we've got a lot of money now in the system already, again, with that bipartisan infrastructure bill, more money coming into the system, hopefully with the Bipartisan Innovation Act. But if we don't have the, the workforce, the skilled workforce uh, to, to help build the equipment, uh, we're gonna do ourselves a disservice. And, and right now in Iowa, uh, you could not visit an equipment manufacturer, small, medium, or large without seeing a, you know, jobs wanted, uh, or, or, you know, outside. And, and it's a challenge and I think, we have not done a good enough job as an industry to talk about these great careers that you can have in equipment manufacturing, Dustin. A, a career uh, in our industry, a job in our industry pays 35% above the national average. These are, these are good paying jobs. They're family sustaining jobs. And also, I mean, maybe you can speak to also the situation. I mean, we heard stories last fall where, you know, the, the dealerships were out of parts because the supply chain was just a mess. We had, a, I talked with a market analyst who was, knew a farmer in Illinois 
who had a combine part break and he went to the dealer and they couldn't find one for a six state radius and finally got easier for him to trade in the combine than it was for him to get the part because it was going to be at least a three month wait before he could get it. And now we're going to be going into spring planting season. Has any of that eased or are we still in danger of those kind of setbacks too? Well, we, we, we very much are uh, in, in danger. And I think this again speaks to the need to, to do something, uh, uh, you know, about our current global, you know, current supply chains, uh, you know, some of the bottlenecks that we're seeing uh, at U.S. ports and then addressing, obviously, you know, the fact that we have been competing on a non-level playing field in the, in the global economy. Right now, lead times for service parts are four to five times longer than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, it has nothing to do with equipment manufacturers not wanting uh, to provide service parts. Obviously, you know, we, uh, we depend on our customers uh, to, to be successful. Uh, and, you know, when farmers succeed, equipment manufacturers succeed. But this has everything to do with the bottlenecks of ports uh, and with some of the current, you know, practices within the shipping industry. Let me let me tell you this. Right now, it is more profitable if you are a, a shipping company to have those big ships come into, let's say, the port of Long Beach to offload containers with inputs and goods from, from Asia, not, not exclusively China, uh, and then to turn around right away so you can hoof it across uh, the Pacific and to refill those ships again to send them back to the U.S. It pays three times sometimes more going from Asia to the U.S. than it does going from the U.S. to Asia. So what that means is that all those containers that are sitting just outside the port with export-ready goods will not get on the ship because the, the shipping companies would rather send empty ships back to Asia. That's how crazy the situation is right now. That may not be the technical term, but I think you know what I mean, right? So what we've been pushing for as well um, is a measure that Senator Ernst supports and, and Senator Grassley as well. We talked about it during our event. It's called the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. It's a bill introduced by Senator Thune that would help put an end to these practices and would ensure that you know we can address some of the shortages that you mentioned, right, that farmers and ranchers care deeply about, meaning service parts, and that can also help alleviate some of the pressure on equipment manufacturers who are not getting the inputs that they need from global suppliers so that they can finish those pieces of equipment and get them out to customers. You know, and you brought up that shipping industry. We just heard last week about a situation, too, where containers that are moving towards ships to get loaded can't get loaded because they didn't put the right chassis underneath the, underneath the uh, container to get it loaded because if you have for lack of better terminology, if you have an orange container, you better have an orange, uh, you know, chassis underneath it for lack of, like I said, generalization there. But it, it, you know, seems like redundant and maybe even, what's the pronoun I want, adjective I want to use? Uh, stupid rules are, are, are uh, causing them to uh, even have more backlogs on top of the situation? Yeah, and, and you know, we, we really need that's it's a great uh, it's a great example that's of the many many uh, issues that are plaguing our industry and not just our industry but manufacturing as as a whole. We really need our elected officials in Washington uh, to to set aside and we we've, we've talked about this a lot over the years to set aside their differences to put policy ahead of politics and to get some wins for American equipment manufacturers, American business, and Americans in general, farmers and ranchers, and, and just the average Joe. Uh, you know, the, the whole function of government should be to make it easier for all of us to do what we do best. And in our case, that's making, you know, world-class equipment in places like Knoxville, Iowa, and, and across the great state of Iowa. So we're hoping that, that they can finally uh, come together, uh, as I mentioned, Democrats, Republicans, House and Senate are, are starting the process uh, this week of hashing out hopefully a compromise uh, between the House version and the Senate version of this bill uh, with, the, with the goal of getting a final product to the president's desk for, for his signing, uh, hopefully before the end uh, or before the August recess. So that gives them a couple of months, but you know that's not a whole lot of time in Washington, unfortunately. And so we, the message that we've been delivering to to the entire Iowa congressional delegation is: please, 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 do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. It may not be the perfect bill that that you would have drawn up had it just been you, uh, but that's not reality, right? We got you know a lot of members in in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate want to have a say. So let's get a win for American equipment manufacturers from farmers and ranchers. Let's unclog our ports and let's get going again. You know, growing great produce in Iowa, making great equipment, selling it to customers around the world. All right. Well, Kip, I thank you so much for taking the time and a lot of great information to share with our viewers. Uh, you know, we will definitely tell them to make their voice heard to their congressional representation as well. Hey, thank you for everything that you do, Dustin, and I enjoyed being on the show. 
All right, that's Kip Eidelberg here on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network.